record on the computer. That's a and we are off. So again, Benjamin Solitaire with the Civic Engagement Commission. I'm going to hand it off to Charlie from HPD to do the Introduction to Affordable Housing Workshop. Charlie, off to you. Thank you so much, Benjamin, and thank you all for spending your evening with us. Um, we are from um, New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. My name is Charlie Rudoy, and I'm here for my with my colleagues from the Neighborhood Planning Team. Um, my co-presenter is Yuju Park, who you'll hear from in a bit, and also joined by our Director of Neighborhood Planning, Street Platkin, and our Deputy Director, Renee Whittison. Um, next slide. So tonight we're going to talk about, um, you know, this is Affordable Housing 101, but to build up to Affordable Housing 101, or to Affordable Housing, we're going to talk a little bit about New York City's housing crises, um, some of the ways that city, the city is working on affordability, and then get into the types of affordable housing and kind of the mechanisms um, that define affordable housing. But before we do, I'm going to launch a poll. Um, I would love to just see um, which boroughs are in the room tonight. Um, and after you've <clears throat> selected your borough in the poll, um, we'd love if you would drop in the chat your community board. Uh, make sure to include the borough. So uh, I know we're asking you to do two things, but uh, vote in the poll. And then in the chat, you could say um, your borough and that and your community board number. I'm going to give it. 20 more seconds. We're going to have, I have a feeling we're going to have an upset. Oh, oh, we've, we've had very strong Bronx representation, but tonight <laughs> it's looking like Brooklyn is, oh, okay. I'm going to stop the poll. Oh, wow. Sorry. I'm watching the results come in and it's so neck and neck between the Bronx and Brooklyn. Um, all right. We're going to end the poll. So it looks like we have um, Brooklyn is just edging out the Bronx here. 37% for Brooklyn, 35% for the Bronx. Manhattan making a strong showing. Queens is in the building. Staten Island sends their regrets, but we know that they are here in spirit. Um, yeah, so next question. Um, you've already put in the chat your community board, um, but feel free to keep doing that. Um, next one. And then, you know, weather today was a little mixed and matched, but we're getting excited about spring. So I'd love to hear in the chat, what is the best place in your district to spend a nice spring day? Um, we take these recommendations very seriously. Um, so I'd love to take a second and hear um, where you would spend the perfect spring day. Um, already seeing Cretona Park, Wild Botanic Garden, the Seaport, a Mets game, love Shirley Chisholm Park. Um, oh, I don't know River Garden. Oh, that's a great idea. Jefferson. Okay. This, yeah, we got to make sure we save this chat because we've got some good, good ideas coming in. Um, I will turn it over to Yuju to talk a little bit about um, what we do at HPD and then we'll dive into the content, um, but keep the, keep the parks coming. Thanks everyone for your recs. Hi everyone. So we are from HPD, like Charlie mentioned. HPD stands for the New York City Housing Preservation and Development Agency. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about what we do. So we do a lot here at HPD, starting with ensuring housing quality, and we have a very large team of code enforcement officers. Um, they're seen on the right in this photo, um, and they conduct inspections and issue violations. So as you can see, we conducted around 70, 740,000 inspections and issued around 730,000 housing violations in 2021. So that is quite a lot. Um, we also work to preserve existing affordable housing while working to create new affordable housing. And we've preserved and created a lot of homes, as you can see. And lastly, we engage with the community to make sure our neighborhoods are strong and diverse. Um, and we do this through neighborhood plans. So if the Brownsville plan in Brooklyn sounds familiar to you, the Edgemere plan in Queens, those are some examples of the neighborhood plans that HPD has led. Um, we also do education and outreach about our housing resources and rights. So if you've ever seen our HPD van in your community, um, that's us with housing resources. 
Um, and we also do community engagement around affordable housing that we build on public sites. So asking the community for their input on what types of ground floor spaces they want, what kinds of open spaces they want. So like a dog park or plaza um, and stuff like that. So that is kind of what HPD does. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Charlie. So thanks, Yuju. So yeah, before we get into the specifics of housing initiatives and affordable housing, um, we, we should talk about the impetus for these interventions, which is that we have multiple overlapping housing crises here in New York. Um, so uh, sorry to bring you right back to the chat again, but can anyone throw out some ideas about some housing crises that exist in New York? Like what's wrong with housing in New York City? Or is it perfect? Um, any any things that, that make it hard? Um, and, and you can just throw those in the chat. Um, immediately I'm seeing price coming up, lack of family size units, that we're gonna talk about that in a bit, quality, the rent is too, I appreciate you using the word darn, but you might wanna use another word, it's too high. Yeah, so people here are starting to touch on some of these things. And I should mention with your other questions you may have, please feel free to pop them in the chat. We're gonna answer questions at the end. Um, so um, ooh, veterans not being able to find housing, parking, vouchers. Yes, these are these are the big issues. Um, but yeah, I just forgot to say up front, we will be having a Q&A at the end. So any questions you put in the chat, we will be saving and we will answer um, later. Um, but anyway, we're hearing about overcrowding, we're hearing about price, we're hearing about poor quality. Um, you, you can go to the next slide. So yeah, I think what we've kind of identified, if, if I had to put it in one sentence, is that most New Yorkers struggle to afford the insufficient amount of poorly maintained housing in an ever smaller collection of neighborhoods. Um, and so the consequences of these we're going to really get into right now, um, you know, homelessness, obviously a huge issue. There's nearly 60,000 people sleeping in the city shelters, including 18,000 children. Um, and of course, the high cost of housing is a primary cause. Um, and people here have already kind of talked about poor quality and overcrowding. Um, now we're going to get a little bit in, in, into rent burden. Um, so rent burden um, refers to people who are spending over 30% of their income on rent. Um, so we see from this chart here that um, around half of New York households are spending too much or, or more than the, the, the recommended amount on housing. Um, and, and we really see that taking off in the last 20 years or so um, when, when that percentage creeps above 30% for millions of New Yorkers. And digging into rent burden, um, you know, half of New Yorkers fall into that category and around 30% are severely rent burdening, meaning they spend more than half of their income on rent. So for example, you know, here we see a family making the minimum wage, although I know with this new bu state budget, we may have a new minimum wage, but um, at this minimum wage, um, this family is looking at what's available on the rental market. Um, and without a subsidy of any kind, this family is likely to spend severe, to be severely rent burdened. We see them here spending 90% of income on rent. So rent occupies nearly all of their income, leaving little to spend on all the other essentials that make up a life. So that's a little bit about how housing costs are too high. And one of the reasons is, is you know, there just aren't enough available houses. So when we see this same family, um, the same household, um, looking for housing, um, the, um, you know, let's say an apartment under $1,000 would, would mean that they are not rent burden. Um, they're contending with the under 1% of such apartments that are vacant. Um, so we have, you know, low vacancy rates in New York, but they, but they vary by the rent. So if you're able, you know, the vacancy rate is 13% for apartments that are over $2,300. That's around triple the citywide vacancy rate. So I think that implies that there's a wider variety of options for renters with higher incomes um, and just a higher likelihood that New Yorkers are going to find the apartments are available um, will require them to take on rents that burden them. So, um, you know, there aren't enough affordable housing or housing period that's kept up with population growth. So here we see a chart of like spikes in, in housing units and spikes in, in housing population. Can anyone in the chat take a guess what's going on um, with this spike in housing production in the 20s? 
Um, why why do we see that line going up so much there? Um, right at the beginning of the graph, we see this this big boost in the 1920s. Subways, the stock market. Someone said the depression. I mean, I think we're seeing the depression more in the sudden drop in the 1930s. But yes, the things leading up to the, the depression, the roaring 20s, um, industrialization and immigration. Yeah, so you guys are painting a picture of, of a growing city, right? Um, and the great migration is happening. Um, the subways are, are, are building out you know, farther into, into Queens and Brooklyn. And, and basically, you know, the outer boroughs are developing alongside all of this housing. Um, there's also just, um, there's new kind of forms of housing. So because we're at HPD and we're interested in kind of um, ways that subsidized housing is, has come to exist. This is when um, in the 1920s, when New York had a limited dividend housing act, which was kind of a landmark law in granting developers property tax abatements in exchange for agreeing to limit their profits. So you see, you know, co-ops start to develop that have are, you know, limited um, in the amounts that people have to pay and, and stuff like that. Um, and then I think um, we're talking about the 50s and 60s also, we see a little spike. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about what's going on there? Either where the population boom is coming from or where the housing boom is coming from. Yeah, so post-war, um, we're seeing um, after World War II, there's housing policies at all levels, um, including the Housing Act that Janet's mentioning to encourage production of housing, especially with veterans returning home. Um, and you know, next week we're doing a fair housing training, so we'll touch more on this. But you know, one thing to note is that you don't see um, necessarily the number of housing units lost to big urban renewal projects, but obviously new housing was brought online through public housing, through the Mitchell Lama program. Um, and other large building product projects. Um, but then, you know, as we get in the 2010s, we see our population booming again, and yet we're not seeing the kind of spikes we saw um, at other times where we um, saw um, populated, population booms. And, you know, part there's a lot of reasons that the homes that exist aren't working for people. So smaller households, someone mentioned this earlier about um, family size units. So smaller households in an expensive rental market means that often single adults who would live in a studio or one bedroom, if they could afford it, are living with roommates, thus occupying two to four bedroom apartments that are now more scarce and expensive for families who need them. So building for smaller households means more units overall. And also constructing this new housing is challenging. Um, construction costs, especially here in New York, are high. Um, and as we confront frequently in HPD, there's really not much vacant land in the city to build on. Um, and so, you know, current zoning in many parts of the city also limits the amount of housing that can be built. And maintaining this housing is expensive. So just looking at NYCHA, which supplies 8% of New York City's rental housing stock and nearly 80% of the apartments in New York City that rent for less than $500 a month. Um, we see $48 billion needed in repairs. Um, public housing is definitely difficult to maintain and you know the low incomes of tenants um, can make it hard to maintain. But it's also worth noting that the federal government has often prioritized middle and upper class, uh, upper middle class homeownership through, for example, the mortgage interest tax deduction, which costs the government around $30 billion a year. Um, and that overwhelmingly is benefiting higher earning taxpayers. So there is definitely an element of, you know, things, situations just being hard to deal with, but there are also policy decisions that do impact our housing here in New York. And another way that maintaining any housing is expensive um, is just, you know, especially when our older housing stock is often where apartments are more affordable to people. Um, these buildings can be quite expensive to maintain. So let's say from this graphic that even if you've paid off your building um, and you're not servicing debt, it could cost you know over $1,000 per month um, 
per apartment um, to maintain a building. So if a thousand dollars is already too much for a low income tenant to afford, not to mention that the landlord may want to make some money, um, then governments, this is where government subsidy needs to come in. Um, and we'll get more into that later about how affordable housing is working. And, you know, New Yorkers have limited housing and neighborhood choice. So um, where homes have been built recently, um, this is since 2014, um, over 200,000 new built homes were built in New York City. This is all homes, not affordable or, but, you know, we're seeing heavy concentration in areas that maybe were formerly zoned industrial and, and were recently allowed to build housing, such as like the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront and the west side of Manhattan. We're seeing development in the South Bronx. But what we're also just seeing is that many communities saw almost no new housing development. And when you zoom in on affordable housing, it's even more stark. So again, there's you know, 50,000 new affordable homes between 2014 and 2022. Um, but most new affordable housing is being was being built in areas that already have a large amount of low cost or affordable housing. Um, and meanwhile, um, some neighborhoods saw zero units or very few units of new affordable housing created. And like I said, we're going to have a fair housing um, presentation next week. We're going to get more into segregation, the roots and the consequences. But suffice to say that there are negative outcomes um, for low-income communities, especially communities of colors that are just not present in wealthy white neighborhoods. So transportation infrastructure and noxious industry that was placed in certain neighborhoods um, coupled with decades of disinvestment means that there's in certain neighborhoods much higher asthma emergency room visits, for example. Um, and also the flip side of that is there's, you know, concentrations of things like banks um, and higher quality schools, even higher life expectancies. Um, even there was a New York Times article last week about traffic fatalities um, and, and kind of where you live in the city being a pr predictor of that. So obviously there are a lot of negative consequences of, of segregation. So um, how is the government, how is the city trying to address some of these issues? So our current administration um, has laid out a housing blueprint, and this plan um, it prioritizes certain things that um, the crises we've touched on, um, certain solutions for them. Um, one big goal is just reducing administrative burden overall to make it easier um, to improve housing stability and kind of get programs off the ground that require, you know, sign off from a variety of different people and trying to like get those processes more streamlined. Um, but also just want to highlight um, an emphasis on on wealth building through home ownership, on addressing homelessness, um, and on and kind of working on our, our our citywide zoning to encourage more affordable housing development. And then kind of zooming in more on us at HPD, we have a toolbox um, that you know if I could break it into two broader categories is like our preserving and creating. Uh, mechanism. So trying to preserve affordability by protecting tenants and homeowners in the housing that they're already in, um, trying to preserve existing affordable housing so that it, units may uh, remain affordable in the future. And then our work um, either financing 100% affordable housing developments or trying to get affordable housing developments tagged on to market rate development. So starting with our first toolbox, um, some of the ways we protect tenants is that we um, do a lot of education, um, provide resources, and have free legal representation. Um, so this can look like housing court support, um, combating landlord harassment, um, and um, giving out emergency rental vouchers, for example. Uh, one specific program we want to highlight because it's it's going citywide soon is called Partners in Preservation. Um, it's It was a pilot program, and it conducted outreach um, and individual counseling to tenants that were identified as high risk of harassment in hundreds of buildings in three neighborhoods, at least in the pilot program. And the goal was to kind of create new tenant associations, and it created 72 new tenant associations and reached thousands of tenants. Um, so as we roll it out citywide, we're really hoping that you know the city can play a bigger role in in getting money through community-based organizations down to the tenant level and really uh, having a lasting effect in by forming new tenant associations. 
And then on the homeowner side, you know, we provide resources to homeowners through materials like our homeowner handbook. Um, we also provide loans, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. But um, most recently, we've added to our kind of suite of counseling and legal services that we offer our homeowners, something called the Homeowner Help Desk. Um, this is a way um, to raise awareness and engage homeowners, um, not just about, you know, resources they could use to finance their home, but also things like deed theft and scams that often target low-income homeowners, especially in neighborhoods with fast-rising property values. And then on the um, preservation side, um, housing preservation is in our name, and we have several programs um, that give owners or tenants a variety of ways to renovate buildings, usually in exchange for a commitment to preserve affordability. So this on the screen is an example of Elizabeth Street building in Manhattan. Um, HPD led the financing of nearly $4 million of renovation to this building um, in anticipation of the creation of affordable co-ops. So through other programs like this, we've been able to preserve around 135,000 affordable homes since 2014. Um, and of course, owners of small buildings, including the ones they live in, are also renting out apartments at affordable rates. So when we support low-income homeowners with repair loans, for example, we ensure their stability and the opportunities they offer renters. Um, and also, as we mentioned up front, we enforce the housing maintenance code um, so that New Yorkers' um, safety and health can be preserved in their housing. And so housing development is also in our name. Um, Yuju is going to get into more detail about what affordable housing really means. Um, but, but for now, I will just say HPD finances affordable housing um, on both public and private property. Um, we do this through loans, tax incentives. Um, sorry, our loans and financing programs. Um, are used to develop this housing. And so if we if it's a city-owned property, for example, we will have a request for proposal that includes um, community feedback um, to develop housing on land and also private property owners can approach HPD for financing. And of course, um, you know, two out of three homes built in New York City since 2014 were market rate. They were on private lots and HPD had nothing to do with them. So we, we don't build most housing in New York, but we do um, administer zoning and tax incentives, which include things like mandatory inclusionary housing um, so that um, we can work to get um, some affordable housing um, tagged on to the market rate development that is overwhelmingly happening here in New York. And of course, that's in the, the context of, of zoning, but there's also tax incentives um, that allow, um, allow some benefit to developers of market rate housing if they include some affordability. So I've used the term affordability a lot, um, but it, it's not, it should not be like apparent that I mean one thing by it. So I think Yuju is going to walk us through the types of affordable housing. Thanks, Charlie. So we're now going to transition to what we mean when we talk about affordable rental housing, at least. But first, I would love to hear from some of you. Uh, what are some types of affordable housing in New York City? If you can pop that in the chat. Any ideas, anyone? Rent stabilized, definitely. Yep, another rent stabilized. NYCHA, public housing, Section 8 vouchers, Mitchell Llamas, rent control. Yeah, all great tools. And we're going to get into some of that. Thank you so much for putting those in the chat. So these are the types of uh, affordable housing, rental housing. Um, and so as, as you've seen in the chat that you all put in, uh, New York City is really home to a spectrum of affordable housing types. And we've categorized the major types, starting with those that have federal government subsidy, and those come with a variety of regulations, such as public housing and housing vouchers, like some folks mentioned here. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have unregulated housing. Um, and many New Yorkers live in unregulated units that they feel that they can afford. So that's why we include that in the slide. Um, and in the middle of this spectrum, of different types. Um, we have pre-1974 rent stabilized apartments, which are actually a unique part of our housing stock here in New York City. Um, and we also have government administered housing. So that includes the housing the city finances, as well as those built with zoning or tax incentives. 
So ultimately, housing affordability will always be relative to the household, but we do have some specific regulatory tools that the government uses to keep housing costs lower. So the first one that you see here is income restriction. So that's where a home has income based eligibility. Um, and the basic intent here is to really match housing subsidies with households that need them. The second tool is rent increase protection or rent stabilization, if that sounds familiar, um, and that protects households from sudden rent increases. And the last tool uh, is rent burden protection. So that means that if a household's income uh, decreases, their rent remains at about 30% of their income. So now we're going to do a quick quiz on how these tools apply to these different housing types. Um, which of the following types of housing um, feature all three of the tools that I just mentioned? So income restrictions, rent increase protections, and rent burden protection. And Charlie just launched the poll. So we'll give it a bit for folks to answer. Give it 30 more seconds. Gotcha. Okay, so 50% uh, said public housing, 5% um, said rental subsidy or vouchers, 20% said government administered, 10% said rent stabilized, and 15% said unregulated. Nice. Thanks, everyone. So the answer is um, public housing and rental vouchers. So um, on this chart, green means that the tool is present in that housing type. So a lot of you were correct. Um, public housing and rental vouchers deploy all three of these affordability tools. So they are income restricted, rental increases are limited, and households are protected from rent burden. Um, so on the far right, as you guessed, unregulated housing is not regulated by any affordability tools. Um, we have pre-1974 rent stabilized housing, um, and that means that includes it includes rent increase protections, hence the name, but there are no income requirements and no protections against rent burden. And then we have housing administered by HPD right in the middle with both income restrictions and rent regulation, but no rent burden protection. I just wanted to highlight that HPD administers thousands of rental vouchers in New York City today. Um, and we're now going to focus on that middle category here with government administered housing since HPD finances thousands of units of this type um, every single year. So at HPD, our strongest influence is over government administered housing, um, where we can apply direct city investment to build new income restricted rent regulated homes. So as Charlie mentioned, we build 100% affordable um, buildings on both public and private property around the city. And these homes have varying levels of affordability based on our financing programs. And here at HPD, we call them term sheets. And these affordability levels, um, they determine the rental price of the units and the household income eligible to rent those units. But understanding how the actual rents and eligible incomes um, are determined, um, that requires understanding HUD's income limits, which can be a little confusing. So we're going to try to break that down for you. Um, so HUD stands for the Federal Housing and Urban Development Agency, and they create income limits every year to guide their distribution of housing funds across the country. So if you've heard of the term low income housing tax credits, LIHTC, um, that's one type of fund that's distributed by HUD. We have rental vouchers. Um, and these income limits are set by HUD. So New York City does not have control of these income limits. Um, and you'll uh, hear these income limits referred to as AMI. Um, AMI stands for area median income, but doesn't actually rep uh, represent the average income, um, which is pretty confusing. So we wanted to visually share what these income limits actually look like. So on the chart on the right, you see um, all three different types of shades of red. Um, and so HUD defines three eligible income categories for its subsidies, as you can see, and it's mapped by income and household size. So in the lightest pink at the very top, we have the lowest earning less than 30% AMI. So to translate this um, into income, uh, it's less than around 36,000 for a family of three. We have the lower income households. They earn between 31 and 50% AMI. So that's around 36,000 for a family of three. Um, and then the dark red at um, 
the dark red at the bottom. So those are our moderate households and they earn 51 to 80% AMI. So that's around 96,000 for a family of three. Um, and in this white area, we have 120% AMI. So that's around 144,000 for a family of three. Um, and so hopefully that was a little helpful just to put actual incomes and household sizes to what we deem as affordable housing. Um, and I know it's still been a little abstract. So I wanna show you how these income limits or AMIs actually translate to um, a real project, eligible incomes for a building constructed today. Um, and many of you may be familiar with um, Housing Connect. That's our affordable housing lottery system. And uh, we have a project, Victory Commons, currently on Housing Connect. Um, this is 100% affordable housing. It's financed by HPD, which means it's income restricted and households making between 30% and 80% AMI are eligible to apply for this building. Um, There's 79 units in this building. And like I mentioned, it's currently up on Housing Connect if you wanna take a closer look. So this is the eligibility by income required to apply for Victory Commons. Um, and as you can see, only households making 30 to 80% AMI can apply to these buildings. So if we take a look at what this would actually look like for income limits, for a one bedroom apartment, this is what you'd be paying for rent for a one household, one person household. So 30% um, AMI, we have income limit of 30,000 all the way up to 80% AMI at $75,000. And then for a three person household, this would look like uh, $35,000 to $95,000 would be your eligibility range to be able to apply for this apartment. And these rents and incomes are based on the previous year's HUD income limits. And after we build that housing, um, it takes a really long time, it goes onto Housing Connect, which is, again, our lottery system. And we really quickly just wanted to show you what the lottery page for affordable units look like, if you aren't familiar. So this is the landing page that you'll see. Um, Housing Connect is now available in the many languages that New Yorkers speak, so it's super accessible. So if you see the... Uh, the globe icon on the very far top right, um, lots and lots of languages to translate that. So it's easy for folks to understand. It's pretty simple. So this is the page where for rentals, um, where it shows you all the affordable units New Yorkers can apply for. Um, on this tab next to the rentals, you see sales. So we do have affordable home ownership units as well. So if you click on a building, we click on Victory Commons that we just went over, um, it will give you information on where it is geographically on the map, if it's close to schools or subways, um, and then it'll also tell you your eligibility. So if you scroll down, this is, this is only a, a snapshot of um, the eligibility. The eligibility range for Victory Commons is actually much bigger than this, but um, this is just an example. So if you look at your eligibility, scroll down, and you say that you're a household of two, you have an income of around 54,000, you'd look at this and say, okay, I'm eligible. And then all you would have to do is click agree and submit, and then you would wait to see if you won or not. So it's pretty simple. Um, and that's our housing lottery tool um, of how it gets built and all the way to how um, it gets leased up. And with that, I'll hand it back to Charlie. Thanks. Yeah, so um, just in the conclusion, um, what we've seen, um, we have overlapping housing crisis in New York. Um, we're our city, us and the city agencies, including the mayor's blueprint have programs that are trying to protect tenants, preserve existable affordable housing and create new affordable housing. And affordable housing, as a lot of people are pointing out, is relative and it comes in many forms. Um, and we finance and administer affordable housing at HPD. Um, so if you're interested, especially because we have a community board um, audience here, I'd like to point out the Equal Development Data Explorer or the EDI. Um, this is where you can kind of look at um, data about affordable housing production and general like affordability, like who can afford housing in your neighborhood broken down by those AMIs that you do describe. Uh, you can get your community district level data um, and you can also see a map of displacement risks um, so i i highly recommend this tool uh, this is just a good um, good housing data tool 
So we're going to open it up for questions in a second, but I just want to highlight that next week we will be back at this exact time doing a fair housing training. Um, so register, you can register for that in the same way you did uh, with the Civic Engagement um, Commission's website. So we're going to open it up for questions. What we're going to do is we already have some from the chat. Um, so I'm going to go... Um, back and forth from questions from the chat and then to raised hands. Um, so you can do either. Um, and to help us with answering questions, um, we have Sarit Platkin, who's our uh, Director of Neighborhood Planning. We also have our, our Deputy Director, Renee Whittison, is in here as well. Um, so um, a first question we had from Maurice was talking about affordable housing. Do you mean both for ownership and rental? Um, and I think that's that's a really important question, um, especially as home ownership is definitely a priority of this mayoral administration. Um, a lot of what we build um, is rental, um, but as you mentioned, we do have, um, for example, preservation programs that specifically look towards creating um, co-ops, so their home ownership opportunities, um, as well as as building new construction home ownership um, units. Um, and it's especially when we're looking at um, our request for proposal process for when we build on public land, that's something we ask the community about a lot is, do you have a preference for homeownership here um, versus rental? Obviously, a lot of that depends on, you know, what, what can work for financing a building. But another element is just the trade-offs inherent in that. So our home ownership programs, the base income to apply for them is often pretty high. So often we're when we're thinking about the trade-off of if a community is going to have our home ownership programs, then if you think about those kind of income limits that Yuju presented earlier, um, the this is an opportunity that may not be available to people making, you know, the low to um lower income. Um, and so it's just it's just kind of project to project the trade-off of of what um how feasible home ownership could be. Um, but I definitely agree with the sentiment that, you know, as we're, as we're working to, to leverage city resources to house people, we should also be thinking about how we can give people a chance to, to build wealth and have the stability of home ownership. Um, Frederica has a hand up um, if, you, if you would like to unmute. Yes, thank you so much. I'm uh, with Community Board 2 in Manhattan. We have a site that is ripe for affordable housing development. Uh, half of it is held in joint custody by uh, DEP and destined to be open space developed by the parks uh, department. And the other half is going to be developed by HPD. So my question is, how common is it for these three agencies to actually collaborate in the development of the site, or are we destined to have each one of them uh, stake claim to an individual part of the site? Thanks, Frederica. Definitely appreciate your concern, and interagency is really um, important to us. And just want to highlight that we are in communication with DEP and city planning, um, and so we are holding a lot of meetings and conversations. So we should have an update for the community board um, sometime in the next couple of weeks. So you're holding these meetings, but they're not part of your envisioning process because your envisioning process is extremely um, limited. Yeah, so our conversations are purely internal right now with interagency. So we're trying to figure out, um, you know, what's possible, what's possible for DP, what's possible, um, so it doesn't uh, encroach on their water um, facilities. So we are in conversation, um, and we will be reporting back hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Okay, we hope that you can kind of slow it down so every every constituency can be heard. And thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Frederica. You. And yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting because we do build 
like you said, on, on whatever city owned land is available. Um, so to give another example, we're currently working on a project in Staten Island that's on a um, sanitation garage. So we're working with the uh, uh, sanitation garage that's moving. So we're working with the Department of Sanitation on that. So I think Frederica is getting at the, the intricacies um, in, in kind of a city with limited public space, but public agencies who have, you know, different lands and different stakes on lands, but um, we're all working towards a similar goal. Um, I want to get to another question that was in the chat, which was about defining fair housing compared to affordable housing. Um, you know, so obviously, we're having two different trainings about each of them. So today, as we talked about affordable housing, we were kind of walking through um, the types of housing that you might call income restricted housing, um, the, the housing that are built with subsidy or otherwise. Um, and fair housing refers to housing that's addressing the legacies of discrimination. Um, so the Fair Housing Act which was passed in 1968, which outlawed um, discrimination in the renting, buying, and financing of housing. Um, you know, everything from um, people who are trying to use rental vouchers and getting and being told, I don't accept vouchers here, that's housing discrimination, that's a fair housing issue, to patterns of, you know, um, when a when a community rejects all multifamily housing um, to protect neighborhood character, um, in some instances, you can think of some um, like some formation of suburbs or just legacies of things that are less outright discrimination, but more patterns. Um, we also consider those fair housing issues. So that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about. I won't take up more time about that um, because we'll do a training on that next week. Um, do I, was there another raised hand? If not, I'll go to another one in the chat. So someone had asked in the chat, um, family of three working part-time earning less than 30K, um, what housing help is available? Um, so yeah, I mean, as as Yuju showed in our in our charts, you know, HPD builds um, for some some pretty low incomes, but often the lowest incomes um, do not um, account for like those those HUD AMIs that are set. And so for for households making that income, um, rental subsidies are often the best way to get support with housing costs. Um, so those would be voucher programs. Um, however, re relatively recently, HPD also now reserves 15% of units in its housing for families coming from shelters. Um, and so often those are the lowest, our lowest income households, 15% um, of units are set aside, um, set aside there. So now I'm going to go to Jeff. My question is, why is there no reference to senior housing? Uh, these people are all on fixed incomes and uh, they have strict uh, income coming in. And there's no mention of any affordable housing for any of these people. That's a great question, Jeff. Um, so at HPD, we, we do build um, exclusively senior housing. So. Um, we have a program called Senior Affordable Rental Apartments, SARA, um, and those, um, if the income charts for those account for fixed income, so like, you know, zero to $50,000, for example, um, would, uh, incomes would be set aside and, and really not available to like very high incomes. Um, and so, yeah, we, we absolutely build um, senior housing um, and we um, also Obviously, seniors can can apply to any any building, any HPD rental um, that they qualify for, but only seniors have the opportunity to apply for certain HPD developments. And um, I, just, I we had another question about home ownership um, and wealth building, so I want to bring in our deputy director Renee really quickly to uh, address that. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that in addition to building senior only rental housing, HPD does also build affordable homes for sale. 
um, recognizing that affordable ownership is out of reach for a lot of New Yorkers. Um, so that is that is also something that HPD is prioritizing. So we had a question from the chat. Um, I know that the old Housing Connect um, have been developments that were for people in certain industries like film and arts. Why has there not been talk about developing housing for human and social service workers, keeping in mind how important their work is um, and contract limits? Um, so definitely recognize the importance of that work. Um, we it's, we just talked about kind of the distinction between fair housing and affordable housing. Fair housing issues do arise when you when you start to you know specify um, certain populations who can live in housing and certain who can't. Um, I I will say that on HPD Housing Connect there are certain preferences like there's a, a I believe a 50% um, community preference for people who live in the community district that's being built in. Um, this is something that has also raised, you know, issues with people and, and there are, there's controversy about, but if you live in an area where um, a, a building is being developed, and I believe there's a 5% preference for, for uh, employees of the city of New York. Um, but other than that, um, it's hard to really get to get so specific about whose housing is for when, first of all, we have such enormous needs of of everyone, so many people needing housing in New York, and that there are real fair housing issues when you say this is for, you know, specific, specific people. Um, so I'm going to go to a hand that I saw up. It was, um, forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Glorinette? Uh, yes, it's correct, Glorinette. Um, I just uh, wanted to get an answer on the application process, because I've noticed that a lot of them, it's not, you're not able to do it online. A lot of them, uh, even though the process is online and it seems like it should be fairly seamless, it's a majority of them. I, I think I haven't come across one that says basically like you have to send in a paper application. You have to wait until they send you the application back. And if you send more than one application, you're automatically disqualified. And, and then under like the application online, it says if you submit one online, you're automatically disqualified. So it, it kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I feel like it's made more difficult than it has to be. And this, and I'm just curious, when, when was the last time you, you used Housing Connect? Um, within probably the last year. Um, I've just noticed it's just like, uh, some, sometimes I don't even get the applications back, the paper application back on time before the, the expiration date for the apartment closes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, if, if it's an issue like that, I think you, you should definitely, you can definitely, you know, submit a, a ticket for something like that. Um, but there have been recent updates to Housing Connect in response to a lot of the complaints just like this. Um, they're calling it now Housing Connect 2.0. Um, and so I think now there, there, there's still all, always going to be a paper option. They will always take paper, but certain things that were, were more onerous or required things like that are now more streamlined. Um, so if if you have a recent experience at, with Housing Connect, I think you should definitely reach out about that. But I I hope that some of these concerns have been addressed by by the updates to it. Oh, thank you. So um, we had a question in the chat about provisions to support voucher holders in our current current housing crisis. Um, housing assistance search waiver of 12 months. Um, and, you know, that those, ex those expiration dates can come up. Um, and I think that we're going to touch actually more on this in our fair housing training. Um, but there are definitely new provisions to support voucher holders. Um, that's part of the, um, our where we live fair housing plan. Um, because first of all, um, you know, if you have a voucher, we, we heard from a community member, giving me a voucher is like giving me the keys to a Volkswagen and then saying, go find the car. You know, it's not always just because you have a voucher doesn't mean it's easy to use. So we're, we're trying to build up our programs that both um, 
enable people to find how ha- find um, housing where they can use their voucher, um, get assistance looking for that housing, and then on the flip side, both incentivizing um, more landlords to take vouchers and also cracking down on voucher discrimination. And a similar question came up about um, SCRE, um, which is the Senior Citizen Rent Increase um, Exemption Program. Obviously, this is not a voucher. It's, it's a program. Um, we do not oversee that program, um, but we, we know that our sister agencies both oversee that program. And also, that's another thing that enforcement, is, we want more enforcement on, is people who are eligible to not have their rent increased for disabilities or for or for their age, um, that's something the city really considers important. Um, so we have about four minutes. Um, so I think we could answer one more question. Um, and I'll go to Janet, who's had their hand up. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Um, I just had a question about if there was any initiative being done for like CUNY students um, and affordable housing. If I'm not mistaken, I do believe somewhere where you guys, I think were holding like scholarships, but if you can elaborate more on that. So um, I'm gonna see if any of my colleagues have an answer to this. This is not something that I wanna give you a wrong answer about. Um, but as a as a former CUNY student myself, I'm interested in. So, um, Sarit or Renee, do you have any knowledge about this? And if not, we will get your contact and, and get back to you about it. So, just just to clarify, the question was whether full time students are eligible for HPD housing. Yes, that yes. Yeah. So, unfortunately, this is actually an area where. Um, you, we cannot offer housing to full-time students. This is sort of a gap in our in our eligibility requirements. Um, but we, you know, encourage you to um, pursue HPD housing once you are completed. You know, once you've completed your your degree and kind of check back for opportunities at that point. So we're about at time, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ben, but I, Benjamin, but I just first want to say thank you so much for coming. We hope that you'll uh, join us for our fair housing um, next week. Um, and I'm just going to pop in the chat um, a little survey that we have um, just to let us know what, um, what information was relevant to you, what information you did not hear that you wanted to hear. Um, et cetera. But thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Thank you so much to the Civic Engagement Commission for hosting us. And I'll turn it back to Benjamin. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it was really great uh, to hear. I'm glad that everybody was, so many people joined us tonight. I hope they learned something. We will be sharing some of these resources on our um, CEC page, which I've also shared a link, a couple of links, uh, a couple of times uh, in the chat. Uh, where you can see upcoming trainings and archived trainings. We haven't necessarily archived these yet because they're still going on, but they will be posted there. Um, but uh, I think that's it. It's yeah, it's seven, 6.59. I'll just throw in one more plug to keep an eye out for the People's Money Vote period starting May 10th, going through June 25th, uh, where everybody the city age, 11 or older, regardless of immigration status, will be able to vote. So if you have your uh, your... 11 year olds and up, they can uh, have a chance at how to spend some of the city budget, which is really exciting. So with that, I will say thank you so much for everybody for coming. Thank you, Charlie, Sarit, uh, Yuju, Renee, you guys were great. I uh, look forward to next week's Fair Housing Workshop. Good night. Good night, everybody.